other slide. Hi, I'm Kathy Herman. I'm from Goddard Riverside Community Center. And I actually, in an earlier incarnation, yes. I was working on caring communities um, back when Goddard Riverside was doing Capitol Hall. So it's a kind of a small world. Um, I'm here to talk about Capitol Hall, which is on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Um, but first, let me just mention, because it sort of comes into play when we talk about how we approach the rehab um, of Capitol Hall, that um, Goddard Riverside, some of you may know, um, does a lot of work on homeless. We have a big street outreach program, a big mental health program, ACT Team, and so forth. Um, and our mission is not only to you know, provide services, but also to engage people and help them change their lives through you know, becoming active. So when we were approaching the building, because we didn't have as much you know, uh, mothballed space, it's a great term, um, one of the things we took into account was how could we use the renovation as a way to help engage people when they are living in the building. So just the, this is the building when they were putting in the windows in the front. Um, it's not the most attractive picture, but I chose it because I thought, you know, you wanted to see something like a before and after. Um, and I kind of like it because they have the great arch windows and there's a workman up there on the windowsill, like about to put in the windows. So um, we started construction uh, December, this is 2014. Um, Nile, when did we close? 2012? December 2012, like the last day of December. Um, so just to step back into the um, old days of the early 80s, um, if any of you are familiar with the Upper West Side of Manhattan, there were you know, numerous SRO hotels, not all of them in good shape, most of them privately owned, or maybe all of them privately owned, but certainly were saving as a resource. Um, we were lucky in that there was an unusual group of people on that block. It's the 100 block of West 87th Street. It's between Amsterdam and Columbus, you know, pretty incredible. At that time, though, that was a, the biggest urban renewal area in the country, 20, 20 solid blocks of urban renewal on the Upper West Side, um, and a lot of un, very unstabilized housing. So um, the owner of Capitol Hall uh, was beginning to, you know, stop renting it. He um, people on the block weren't happy with it, and the block kind of split. There was one faction, and they're still very active in the board. They're board members of Capitol Hall and, and at Goddard Riverside. Um, they came up with a really brilliant idea. They came up with a block association where the bylaws said that anybody who was a resident of the block was a member of the block association which is pretty, if you just think about the implications, that was such a clever thing to do. So they reached out to the residents living in Capitol Hall and invited them to join the block association. So, you know, it was certainly the opposite of a, of a NIMBY attitude. Um, I hear from some of the people that the tensions were so high so that the block was really split. It was the dividing line, and depending on how you felt about Capitol Hall and other SROs in the neighborhood, was kind of who you remained friends with. And some people still don't speak to each other. It was it was really that that big a thing. So it was a 201 unit SRO, privately owned. Um, the Callahan decision had come out in what, like 79, 80. The city um, and the Koch administration was under pressure to try to do something to preserve homeless housing, um, despite a lot of the you know NIMBY attitudes. So um, a group of people for, with Goddard and Settlement Housing Fund, um, I think uh, Brooke Astor was involved, um, and Felice Machete at HPD at that time, uh, Anchor Bank um, came up and we were able to get a participation loan, uh, which is the same thing Caring had, which meant the city put in like 1% money. Um, this is before tax credits were used widely for this kind of thing. And Anchor Bank put in money at their um, interest rate, which is about 12%. And we had um, a lot of debt that we had to pay um, in the construction loan. And because of that, and because the acquisition price was high, because they were buying it from an owner who could have you know, wanted to just sell it on the market, um, about 4,000 units of the total loan went to rehab. And all of the rest went, went to acquisition. So only looking through the old pro forma did I realize that it was primarily an acquisition program to save the building. Um, so. We had a building, we had, um, similar to Caring Communities, a, a Section 8 project-based contract. Didn't have super high rents. 
Um, we had rents probably in the 700s, low 800s when we started looking at it. But because we're all in one building, unlike the three sites that they have, we have some more economy of scale. So we were able to sort of operate the building, but the question was what kind of building were we operating at that point? Um, it had, as I said, it had been pretty run down. It had 4,000 unit worth of rehab. Um, it was an old style SRO. Um, as you can see, I'm not gonna read the slide. Um, you know, shared kitchens and baths. We had to replace all of the systems. We had an old number six burner boiler. Um, we had to put a big vent on the roof because the neighbor, you know, would always complain about the fumes. We had like a common kitchen that was just sort of a stove in the basement. Um, I don't make it, want to make it sound like it was a horrible place to live. I mean, the tenants really loved it. Some of the rooms, they would not meet the city's current standards um, of 300 square feet. Now our units, probably the larger ones were around 250 square feet. Didn't have a bathroom, but some of them had nice detailed windows. Um, and as a community, it was a nice place to live, and, and they were in the Upper West Side. They were pretty happy about that. Um, but we wanted to rehab it, and for many, many years, people tried to come up with, you know, can we get like a, an 8 a loan? Can we get a private bank loan? And we really struggled to come up with something. We worked with, you know, Tim Henze and, and, and Niall on, um, from Rockabilly on a plan. I um, approached the city um, to see if we could get an SRO loan. A supportive housing loan and at that time there was reluctance because there wasn't that much money available never is enough money available to put you know the amount of money that it would need to do new layouts um, in existing units because you know how could the city say they were producing new units so um, you know the advisors came up with the idea of let's approach HPD um, on a preservation project which it truly is um, and it wasn't the typical preservation, which again, you know, you're basically acquiring a building. It was acquiring a building, but in fact, gutting it. So let me get to that point where we were going to, um, okay, I'll have a slide of that. But, um, so we, we had to look at what, what our objective was because we didn't want to, you know, throw out the baby with the bathwater. So we knew we had to keep the Section 8 mod contract. RAD had not come out when we were putting the program together. It came out just as we were about to close. So we, we sort of you know, um, went around RAD um, and I don't think we needed it in our project anyway. Um, but uh, so we decided to go ahead and uh, we got bond financing, we got uh, the tax credits that came along with it. Um, we didn't have debt at the time. It meant we were gonna be taking on more debt, but our budget was able to work with that. Um, it did mean we had to give up some of the charming features about the building. And again, in terms of tenants interacting, um, we have an open staircase. Uh, we were grandfathered in under a lot of the fire code. We didn't have the fire stairs. We have two elevators and this beautiful old marble staircase. Um, and tenants meet there and they go up and down and they kind of yell to each other on the staircase. So it's one of my favorite elements. On, that will go, so, and that was some of the trade-offs about doing this gut rehab. We were gonna be making the units smaller because they were all gonna have, or almost all of them have a private bathroom, or if not a private bathroom, you know, uh, just share with one other person. Um, the tenants were really happy about that. Um, we were gonna get all new mechanicals out of it, including converting to gas. Um, which meant we could get rid of the oil tank and then the room that the oil tank is now in is going to be converted to like a whole maintenance shop. So in that way we were finding kind of new space. Um, we were able to repair the facade and, and get a whole new roof. Um, this is, you know, uh, there it is. That's one of the old shared bathrooms and uh, you can see why we had to do something about the building. Um, now, how do we get enough money to do it? Because uh, that's something that everybody has to deal with. These buildings are very expensive. Um, rehab costs are huge, right? 100,000 a unit, more than 100,000 a unit. And even if a unit is, you know, 250 square feet, what is that if you're going to try to do, you know, family homeless housing? So how do you get that much money? And um, this is sort of the brilliance of putting together this financial plan. We had the project-based Section 8 contract. Um, and even though it was a year-to-year -year renewal, the investors um, were willing to bank on the fact that it was going to continue to be renewed. Um, HPD uh, gave all the insurances they could on that. 
Um, because of the location and the building uh, itself, uh, we were able to get not as high appraisal as we might have wanted, but we had a high appraisal like $17 million. Um, we had been socking money away when we were, um, before we had rehab, we only had about $80,000 a year in debt from the city. We just had an interest only loan. So we, um, we didn't waste the money, we socked it away. And we were able to come up with millions of dollars of our own equity, uh, which was very necessary. We got the bond fan financing, uh, which is terrific. We got HPD money. Um, I don't think you're in the construction period, but you know, you're in for the permanent loan. And we got the, the tax credits that come along with the bond financing, which was, you know, that's like kind of the name of the game along with the Section 8 contract. So um, the construction itself was 16 million. Um, you can see all the sources that we had there. And the total development cost, though, is up to 48 million. It, you know, kind of grows quickly. And that's to do a whole gut rehab. Um, okay, so the biggest thing that you have to do with a project like this, and I think this, I don't know whether it's innovative or it's just a matter of survival, but when you're doing preservation, if you can't figure out a way to work with the tenants, then you're not gonna be able to do the project. So um, we had some tenants, as I say, they were happy living there. Most of them did not wanna leave. Um, we had, uh, through attrition, we had stopped renting up a year before we closed. Um, sadly, there is a lot of attrition in the building because our population tends to, you know, their health isn't always good and they're elderly. Um, so we had to relocate about 25 people out of the building. Um, that was included, we have a um, relocation budget in the loan that allows us to do that. So we, you know, the social workers, we have three social workers in the building and a director of social services. They kind of identified people that they thought could live more independently. Um, we had great partners with um, people like Project Find and CUCS, um, Manhattan Valley, who had units, the Times Square, um, and they were willing to rent to our tenants. Um, they select, you know, they screened them, and, um, but we had about 24, 25 people who we externally relocated, um, and we were able to, through the social workers staying in touch with them, we were able to you know, keep them interested and none of them particularly want to come back. They're all really happy where they, where they are, but we can't keep paying their rent forever. So, mm -hmm. um, so how did we kind of get, get, you know, people, they tend to be kind of paranoid um, about what was gonna happen because the big thing, no matter how many times we told them, HPD came out to talk to them, um, they assumed that we were trying to get rid of them. Um, which was the last thing, the opposite of what we were trying to do. So, you know, we just tried to, again, engage people, bring them together. Um, so we had a lot of parties, we had a lot of food, <laughs> free food, um, free beverages and gifts and parties and, you know, talk to them. We had photographs of the architectural renderings. Um, we had much more trouble in the first phase um, of getting people to agree to move, because what we had to do was then move people, if they were in phase one, we're doing it in three phases, they had to agree, if they weren't gonna leave the building, they had to agree to move to another unit in the old part of the building. Um, we had to convince them to do that, and you know, we just, again, just tried to make it as much of a social, you know, fun thing as we could. Um, Lauren's here, who's, who's doing a lot of the relocation now in the building, and, and now we're just moving the final old unit tenants into the completed phase two, and it's like you can't, you gotta beat them off with a stick. You know, it's like, I'm ready to move, I'm ready to move, because they've seen how great the units are. Um, so we're real happy with that. Um, but they all had to, everyone who was there had to live through the dust and the noise of demolition. Um, I think a lot of them found it exciting, um, and they started to see that this is really happening. We've been talking about it for years. Uh, that's Notias Construction there and what used to be the old community room. So that was another issue. We lost you know, all of our communal spaces one by one. We lost our community room. We still had the community kitchen. We, we used to have a kitchen on every floor. We lost the kitchen on every floor. We're down to one kitchen. Uh, we're just about to lose that one kitchen, so we're uh, retaining one of the studios that has a kitchen in it for like our breakfast program. So, um, you know, we're, we're trying to keep a place for people to gather. Um, so this is basically what we went through in phase one. 
Um, one of the big challenges was we are now going to be totally up to date in our fire prevention. So we're, we inst we're installing two new fire stairs. Um, so they had to carve it out of this building as it was an old luxury building and it had like two feet thick concrete, you know, floors. Um, so they had to carve this space for the steel staircase in there and, you know, squeeze everything in. And of course, the columns were not quite the size that they <laughs> thought they'd be. Um, we had a whole article, uh, Local Law 11 work that we had to do, so we integrated that into the rehab. Um, we couldn't convert to gas right away, so we did a transitional conversion to a number two boiler. Um, the staff had to move around to various offices several times, and I won't go into too much detail, but we had to do a lot of decluttering, I'll say, of tenants' rooms, and again, that was a you know, between management and social services, that was a, like an all-court press on, on how to do that. And one of the things that we did is um, we would, you know, get people new furniture. Like, you know, if you'll get rid of this stuff, you know, here, this great new piece of furniture that you can put your stuff in and it's clear, you can see it, you can see what you've got and try to, try to give people some incentives. But that was essential to do. Um, this is a tip floor plan of a typical room, a typical floor, I'm sorry, and um, there, are 20, there were 23 units on a floor. Um, as I said before, one of the parameters was that we couldn't lose any units. So if you have units without bathrooms now, by definition, they're going to be smaller units once you put a bathroom in them. Um, so this is the configuration for, the, for the, um, what it's looking like now. We've done phase one, which is over on the, kind of the, the right side. We're just finishing phase two, which is like the bottom left in the front of the building and we're about to do the back of the building which is which is phase three okay so um one of the interesting things that came out up when we were moving people um for the phase two is that some of the people who are really cagey um, okay, um decided they knew they wanted to be in the front of the building um and so they wanted to do a transitional move so we had to had to deal with that we had a lot of issues um, with the construction. Of course, we moved people into the first phase, like on the coldest day of the winter. Um, and of course, the boiler was, you know, very erratic. Um, but now I'm just about to finish up. So we're now entering phase three to completion. Um, so now we have met with HDC to begin our marketing plan. Um, we are a 60-40 building. I don't know how many of you met, heard Ted earlier that he was trying to make the point how important it is to be able to have some community units in your project and I know nowadays that might be harder. Um, this was done under the old agreement of 60-40, 60 being 60% 60 from DHS and 40% would be community at risk, you know, housing needy people, which allows you to really serve the community by having, you know, a little bit of a mixture of, of folks. So we're switching gears and we're starting to market. The units, our next big challenge is that when all is said and done, even after we move the 25 external relocatees back to the building, we're going to have 77 units <clears throat> to rent up in about four or five months. So it's going to be kind of nonstop. Um, so um, we're, ha we're looking forward to being able to get our common spaces back again. And part of the architecture was um, to use the courtyard. And because it wasn't increasing the floor area ratio, by enclosing that, that's now going to be an additional community room. So again, trying to keep people, give them spaces to be engaged.